we have here? I've got an antique 1891 cast iron Traders Bank of Canada. It's like a big piggy bank. That is pretty cool. There were 1,500 of them originally made. One of these is in a museum in Canada, in Toronto. I believe it. There's a lot of weird museums in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Today, I'm at the pawn shop to sell my Traders Bank of Canada. I'm not a collector of antique banks. I just saw this one. I really liked it. I'm hoping to sell it for 2,500. This is really neat. Cast iron banks became real popular, 1880s, 1890s. And um, they were basically promotional things for like middle class families with kids. They wanted to create a culture of saving and when like these kids to get older, they would go to this bank. You have the little slot there. Each person could have their slot or you could have one for each coin. And um, in 1891, people didn't like paper money for savings because most people regarded paper money as a receipt for real money, which was gold or silver coins. Nice. You'll see $20 bills from back then and they will literally say $20 in gold coin redeemable at right. or redeemable for silver dollars. So where'd you get it? I bought it in a state sale about five years ago. You mind if I take a look at it? Please. This is sort of a semi-famous one. I've seen a couple of these over the years. The way I remember it, this had like a gold paint on it. This was just oiled cast iron on top. Yeah. It's in decent condition. Looks like there's already some issues with the rust. Yeah, it's exactly the way it was when I got it. So how much do you want for it? I've done some research on it, and I've seen it go as high as 4,000, but I'm thinking that I would be happy with 2,500. Okay, I think that's a little high. It's not the best of shape, and you know how these things are. Condition is everything, right? I give you like 900 bucks for it. I think I can get 14, 1500 bucks out of it. Yeah. Can you do a little bit better than that? 1500? Go a thousand. How about 12? I'll go 1100 bucks. I won't go that more. 1100. I'm sure it's a lot more than the five bucks you paid for it at a state sale, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right, you got a deal. Sweet. I'll meet you right up front, and we'll do some paperwork. Excellent. I was very happy to make a deal today. I've decided that I'm going to give the $1,100 to my wife. After all, happy wife, happy life. Hey, what's up, man? How's it going? What do we got? Old school Indian motorcycle toolbox. Oh, wow. Do you mind if I take a look at it? Yeah, absolutely. These are actually pretty cool, man. When you buy a car today, you expect to have a car with a warranty and they're gonna take care of it and fix it every time. Yeah. Back in the day, they give you a toolbox with it. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell my old toolbox that used to be on the Indian motorcycle. I got this from my neighbor who was just throwing out old memorabilia from motorcycles, and so I decided to grab it. I believe it's from the 1930s. I'm looking to get about $200 for this, and anything's better than nothing. You got something really cool here. Old Indians are awesome. They were founded in the 1800s. They were actually a bicycle company, but in the early 1900s, these guys were way ahead of the game as far as motorcycle manufacturing. In the 1920s, they just basically blew up the market with the Indian Scout. It was a really fast, really cool bike. I'm assuming this was the one that was mounted on the four cylinder between 36 and 39 when the Sports Scout came out. This was actually mounted on the swing arm because back then they expected you to know how to work on your motorcycle when you bought it. Yeah. But the cool thing is with Indian, anything is collectible. So any idea what you want to get out of it? 200 bucks. Well, it's your lucky day, man. I'm telling you right now, you got something really kind of cool here and I know what I can get for it. I can sell this for at least 1000 I'm kind of robbing you if I only give you two. Let me, let me give you four. Are you OK with that? How about a 700? You wanted two, and I offered you more than you were asking. How about 600? How about four? Five? Do you know how generous I'm being right now? I'm giving you twice as much as you asked for when you came in here. Let me give you 400 bucks, and we'll call it a day, all right? All right got double what I was asking for, so I'm ecstatic. Now that I have $400, I'll tell my wife I got the 200 and keep 200. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. What do we got here? Well, my wife told me to come down and make you an offer you couldn't refuse. This is Marlon Brando's personally owned 1950s biker leather coat. This was not a movie worn jacket? No, it's a personally owned. God, I so, so wish it was a jacket he wore on the waterfront or uh, wild ones, or or the Godfather. Yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. 
One day I'm gonna ask you a favor. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to the pawn shop to sell my 1950s motorcycle jacket that was owned by Marlon Brando. This jacket comes from the Joe Franklin memorabilia collection. It was auctioned off a couple years back. I just couldn't refuse it. Pretty cool. All right. Um, well, it's Brando. Marlon Brando really was that amazing actor. I mean, he was basically the original actor doing, like, method acting. If he was going to do a part, he tried to live it for a month before he actually started filming. You know, I, I guess his, like, super breakout hit was probably A Streetcar Named Desire because uh, they cast him for that because he was in the play. And I think today most people know him as the Godfather because you really couldn't have had anybody. I can't even imagine that movie with anyone else playing him. So where'd you get it? I bought it off a guy who bought it from an auction. So you don't have any pictures from the auction? I do not. The auction only has a picture of the coat. And all I had was just a letter of authenticity. OK. So by my signature, I hereby certify that the aforementioned item of memorabilia is the original, authentic, and gifted personally to me, to my memorabilia collection, by the timeless personality, Marlon Brando. All right, sweet. And from the looks of it, this is actual wear, not like today where they purposely make something beat up. <laughs> Distress. <laughs> um, how much are you looking to get out of this? I'm looking to get $15,000 for it. <sighs> OK, 15 grand. Um, I'll give you eight grand. I know you need to make money yourself. Uh, I get that. Uh, 10 grand? That's knocking down 5,000 from my asking. I'll give you eight grand. It's a fair price. You know, it sold just a couple yeah. years ago for 11. I figured that's probably what I'll get out of it or I put it in an auction. Come up a little bit more. 8,500. We can make that work. All right, sweet. Um, I will meet you right over there, and we'll just pay for it. Sounds good. I didn't get the $15,000 I was asking for, but his offer of 8,500 was fair, and now I'll be able to give my daughter some money for a down payment on her house. I had a customer come in who has an Ezekiel Baker breech-loading rifle from the 1800s. Alex is really excited about this. You don't really ever get to see prototype, one-of-a-kind guns. The seller's asking 12,500. I'm out at the range today to see if this rifle fires and everything works correctly, it could be worth 20-some thousand dollars. So I'm pretty sure your dad's going to be pissed that you brought me out here instead of him. You know what? He just would have made everything more complicated and annoying. What's up, Alex? How, How you doing, doing, man? I'm well. Hey, what's up, again, buddy? What's going on, guys? I'm excited to see this. Yeah. So this is one of England's finest gun makers from the 19th century. This is a prototype, or it was custom made for a specific customer at the time. Wait, wait, wait. He said prototype. So what do you mean? It's not real? I mean, Baker made this either as a prototype, like a one-off, in order to try to sell it as mass market, or he just made it as a custom order. So a guy came in and said, I want a really good hunting rifle, but I want a breech loader. Oh, this is why you should have brought your dad. <laughs> so uh, we ready to fire this thing, or? Yeah, we're ready to go. So the first thing we do is we use this little lever. We insert the ball. Push the lever forward. Now that ball rolls forward into a little chamber. And now, see, the ball is gone. So then I take the black powder, dump that into the little chamber, push it forward, and now it is loaded. OK, eyes and ears. Comes a bang. Woo! <laughs> so at least it didn't blow up and it works. No, um, it didn't blow up at all. That was cool. The lever stayed down. That actually worked pretty well. Um, so what are we thinking it's worth? I think based on the fact that it works as designed, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's not another example out there. It's a prototype. It's super rare, Corey and it's a really nice looking gun. I think you get 25,000 for it. Wow. Whoa. OK. Um, well, I appreciate it, man. Thanks right. a lot. Thank you very much. Good luck. Appreciate it. Uh, so you still want 12.5 for it? Well, he said it's worth 25, so. <laughs> Would you do 15? 
Uh, I know you gotta make some money. How about 22? How about 18? It's gonna be the most I can do. All right, I can do 18. All right, cool. Appreciate it. Um, you wanna meet me back at my shop? Uh, I'll get you a check and get you paid, all right? Sounds good, thank you. Cool. I was super happy I was able to make a deal today. It wasn't the 25 grand that he said it was worth, but 18,000. Super happy. My wife's gonna be really happy. Dude, the guy's wearing a Rolex. I never thought he was gonna go that low. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. You gonna set up a little casino in here or something? <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad idea. I have a 1933 Rockola horse race machine, and if the odds are in my favor today, I'll make a deal. I'm selling it for health reasons. My wife told me that she's gonna kill me if I don't start getting rid of some of these machines. This is um, deeply cool. This was 1920s, 1930s, the whole temperance movement. Drinking is bad, gambling is bad, everything with fun is bad. <laughs> I don't know who these people were. They just wanted to like make life suck, you know what I mean? <laughs> they, they wanted to take away all the good stuff. And uh, all these slot machine companies had to come up with a way to sell slot machines, but not sell slot machines. Exactly. So the slot machine manufacturers came up with the term trade stimulator. But everyone knew exactly what they were for. They were gambling machines. Sure. This is the horse race slash Wheel of Fortune, right? Right. This is made by a company called Rockola. They made these from 1932 to 1935. You would go into a store, and they would have this on the counter. The gum is actually just a front to say that it was a candy machine, not a gambling machine. Basically, you could bet with the store owner or bet with your buddies. Pick what horse you want. You put the penny in. And the horses will run, and the flag will tell you which horse won, and the ball will tell you what the odds are going to pay. I think it's great. It was just a little way to skate around the law. And that's why you hardly find these things anymore. A lot of these were destroyed. You know, when the cops came in and they found these, they'd take an ax to them. Just great Americana. So. Oh, yeah. And the big question, how much you want for this thing? I'm hoping to get wholesale, which is about $3,000 for this machine. This would retail at an auction anywhere from $4,000 to $4,500. dollars give you 2200 bucks, because I am going to have to spend a couple hundred bucks to make it a little prettier. Well, I'd give you the 200 for the uh, renovations, and I'd go $2,800. I'll go $2,700. bucks. i should not even go that high. $2,750. $2,700. $2, I swear I'll walk over 50 bucks. I will, too. $2,750. No. Nope. I can't do it. $2,700 bucks if you want. $2,750. Have a nice day. I'm out. OK, Rick. Thank you. It was a tough negotiation. I was jockeying for position. Unfortunately, it came down to the wire, and I ended up last. I'm here on the East Coast because Alex has told me about a 1763 Dutch East India Company cannon for sale. And I'm going to go check it out right now. Mike? Yep. What's going on? Ah, oh, same old, same old. This is pretty interesting. Awesome. <laughs> I've had this for about 10 years and redoing my house. I don't want to get rid of it, but my wife is like, we need a kitchen. So where did you get this? I picked it up in a shop when I was traveling on the road a couple years back. Thought it looked awesome. I mean, looks like it's been in battles. It's got scars and stuff on it. Were you using it for, like, home defense? <laughs> <laughs> I've had this cannon for a long time. Being a pirate guy, I thought it would be a lot of fun to build a pirate basement. And we're doing a lot of work and a big renovation on our home, so freeing up some extra money would really help out. It is super cool. I love the fact that it's got the symbol for the Dutch East India Company there. Yep, 1763. So I did a little bit of research on it. I'm not sure what battle it's been in. I mean, I think there's blood still on it from over here from back in some battle. I mean, that's definitely pirate-esque. Yeah, it could definitely have been stolen by pirates. But if it was made for the Dutch East India Company, we'd know it was made for a ship. Mm -hmm. OK, and the Dutch East India Company was started right around 1600, and they traded with everybody. They didn't care if you were Muslim. They didn't care if you were Jew. They didn't care if you were Protestant, Catholic. You know, let's, you know, let's all just get along mm -hmm. and, and make money. It made Holland the richest country in Europe. Have you ever fired it? I've never fired it. I know it does fire because I had someone look at it, but I've never personally fired it. How much you want for it? I'm thinking 35-ish. That's kind of where I'm at. 3,500? No, 35,000. <laughs> <laughs> that I can't do. Um, it's in an amazing shape. Matter of fact, it's almost in too good a shape. 
So, well, let's check it out. I'm asking you for a lot of money, so I want to make sure that you're buying the right thing. All right, so I'm going to give Alex a call, and um, we'll go from there. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you. Alex is a really good friend of mine, so uh, having, having him look at the Canon and giving it the, you know, the actual appraisal amount would be, uh, would be fantastic. So you don't even stop and say hi first, you just go straight to the Canon? <laughs> I was really curious about what size the boar was. How you doing? How's it going? Hey, man. What's up, man? How you doing, Alex? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. I called Rick in Vegas and told him about this Dutch East India Company Canon that he had to come and see. Rick is really attracted to things that are a little bit different, but also has some kind of cultural reference. And so this is the ultimate piece. So, what do you think? So it's a, it's a two and a half inch bore. In English naval terms, that means it's a two pounder, or they also call these, this size cannon a, a falcon. Um, this is a classic naval cannon. I mean, I told you it would be worth coming to see, right? Um, it's pretty amazing. It's impossible to tell what the history of this really was uh, or, or where it was found, but the Dutch East India Company merchant ships were all over the South Pacific. And so, you know, the spice routes, all the trading, I mean, they had an incredibly strong navy, but the pirates knew that these guys were carrying millions of dollars in goods. And so if they could capture what was on that, they were set. Um, uh, this is exactly what pirates would want. All right, so is it all original? So according to this marking, Peter Seast made this cannon in 1763 in the city of Amsterdam for the Dutch East India Company, which is the VOC, which means Dutch East India Company in Dutch. And the nice thing about this VOC is it's not just engraved in. There's actually a small raise to these letters, which means it's part of the original casting. OK. The tube itself is 100% correct. The way in which it's cast, all of these bands, all of this is correct. The patina is excellent. This is extremely hard to fake. This greenish, dark greenish color is exactly what collectors look for. But the biggest test is this one. Ugh. It's heavy enough. Ones that are copies made to deceive, they essentially use a foam core cast around it, and it's it's half the weight it should be. This this is actually a really nice example, the best example of this kind of cannon I've ever seen. Nice. OK, so where do we go from here? Well, before I give you a value, Rick, I think if we could shoot it, it would be really fun, but it would also prove a higher value to Rick to see a working cannon. I mean, are you going to ruin my patina? <laughs> That's not gonna happen, is it? The patina will not be ruined. Patina, as long as my patina is okay, your patina is gonna then be we're fine. Good. All right. Um, so, do we meet at the range? Let's do it. All right. Okay. Cool. You meet us there. Yeah. See All you right. guys there. So, you guys, look like you're ready to go. Hey, Rick. Let's go, Rick. I mean, it looks perfect. I really think she's safe to fire. All right, well, let's blow something up. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that's associated with pirates is kind of folklorish and cool, and this is the ultimate piece. But being able to fire it is really important for collectors because you don't buy a cannon unless it can shoot. If it fires and it fires well, I'll be able to give an accurate value, and it should be pretty good. Thumb the vent. All right. All right. Introduce charge. Ramming. Introduce ball. Ramming. OK, Rick, you can move your thumb. OK. All right, she's rammed, she's ready. Come Eyes here. and ears on, please. A lot better than a 44 Mac, yeah. <laughs> so I think based on what we just saw and how well it performed, I would give a value on it at about 30,000. OK. 30? Yeah. 35 with that patina? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Anything can happen in an auction. All right. But typically, tubes like this that might not be quite as nice go for 15 to 20. I'm almost doubling the price. I think 30 is fair. Could you get more? Maybe. Maybe. But I'm safe at 30. OK. All right? Thank Good you, luck. Alex. Leave Thanks you guys to it. All right, see you, man. That was fun.
So you wanted 15,000 for it, right? <laughs> That's on, <laughs> come on, 30. Uh, I'd give you 18 grand for it. I can't do 18. I mean, I mean you can put it in an auction, but like, but if you get it in an auction, remember, you're going to pay a gazillion dollars in auction fees and everything else. I mean, can you be at like, can you be at 25? Can we... 18 is what I could do. I mean, it's just, that's the number that makes sense to me. That's it, Max. That's it. I got to hold on to it then. I'm sorry. Well, if you change your mind or if your wife makes you sell it, call me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks hey, a lot. Man. It was fun watching that thing go off, though, wasn't it? <laughs> Definitely. It has been an incredible day. I bought two thirds of the stuff that I came out here with, and I shot a badass cannon. <laughs> I need to come to the East Coast more often. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Yeah, pretty good. What do we got? I got uh, five tops, 1967 Pete Rose baseball cards here, mint condition. And you got five Mona Lisas too? I'm dead, don't I wish. <laughs> I don't really know too much about Pete Rose the baseball player. I'm a fan of Pete Rose the gambler. Yeah. Well, I used to be a big collector of baseball cards, and I don't collect any longer. I've got five of these 1967 Pete Rose baseball cards. They're in, like, mint condition. They've got to be worth some money. Pete Rose was the man. Too bad he screwed up. I mean, he definitely would have gone down as one of the best baseball players that ever lived. Oh, yeah, he is. Fortunately, he's in that shoeless Joe Jackson club that no one likes to be in. <laughs> When he was playing, he was one of the greats. I realize he's been banned, but I just I just still think they're really fabulous, neat cards. They're, they're Pete Roses. So how'd you come across these, man? I was cleaning out the garage and stumbled across them. What do you know about them? They're authentic cards. They're labeled Tops 430. The little cartoon shows him hitting one out of the park there. It's got all of his stats for the year. No tears, no marks. You have any idea what these are worth? No, I did do a little checking online. They should be worth about 50 bucks a piece, so it's about two and a half. All right. Before I buy these, I got to know that they're legit. And these things look like they're in great shape, maybe a little too good a shape. My concerns are that they're in, like, almost too perfect shape and that you got five of them. I'm just not willing to take the risk of buying counterfeit cards. I just don't know enough about them to buy them. Well, they're not counterfeit. They've been sitting in my garage for years. Well, there's always a shot. Let me call my dad over to see what he knows about them. Hey, okay. Pops. This guy's got five Pete Rose cards. I figured I'd let you look at them. Seeing as how you don't trust me with anything. Yeah, Pete Rose was the, he was the man back in the day. Won three World Series over 4,000 hits. Uh, on the All-Star team 17 times. So what do you want to know about these? If they're real? I'd be willing to bet on Pete Rose's reputation these cards are real. No. How do you, how can you tell that? What do you, what do you mean? Because the color's all faded, everything's a blur, even his face, it doesn't look silk screened. Oh, they're printed with an inkjet printer. And the picture looks overexposed. They probably scanned it and reprinted it. It's, it's just not right at all. They've been in my garage for years. I mean, that's, they're well, good. They've been faking baseball cards forever. People come in here all the time and think just because they've had an item for years, it's real. No, what it means is years ago, they bought a fake. And another suspect thing is all of a sudden you have five of them that are just perfect. These were bubblegum cards, so they were in a pack with bubblegum. Yeah. Okay, and, and they're not like baseball cards today that come in a nice, neat box where nothing screwed up. Yeah. These were old baseball cards that were just thrown out on the candy shelf. Kids would open them up. So it's really, really rare to find one in good shape. These things right here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch them at all. They look completely fake to me. I think you're wrong, but all right. I'll get something someplace else for them. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks for coming in. Thanks. If these cards are fake, then you know, what else is real? Is the wife real, the dog, the cat? You know, what's real?